Well, I'd like to thank the, um, the panelists and the moderator for um, a really thoughtful discussion. A lot of um, great ideas and um, great advice and um, a lot of hope for the future and uh, nanoscience, uh, nanotechnology, and medical applications. I'm here to welcome you to the, um, the third um, session uh, today on nanosystems and devices. And our uh, first speaker is um, my good friend and colleague, Professor Sangeeta Bhatia. Sangeeta is a HHMI investigator and the John J. Dorothy Wilson Professor at MIT's Institute for Medical Engineering and Sciences, and she's also faculty in electrical engineering and computer science. She is the director of our Marble Center for um, Cancer Nanomedicine and a member of the Ludwig Center for uh, Molecular Oncology, and of course, um, an important part of the KI. Um, I would also like to point out that she's catching up with Bob Langer in um, her elected membership. So, um, so look out, Bob. Um, she's a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Inventors. And so I'm very pleased to introduce her talk um, on protease nanosensors for cancer detection, classification, and monitoring. Hi, everyone. That is a tough act to follow, <laughs> but I'll try. Um, I'm going to tell you about our work in um, activity-based biomarkers. Uh, this is a project that uh, we invented by accident. We were trying to do something totally different. We were trying to make smart MRI contrast agents, um, ended up finding out that we could monitor protease activity in vivo um, without MRI. Um, so I'm going to take you a little bit of a journey. Um, some of the data is published, but a lot of it is new. Um, so I think we've been spending you know, the morning talking about uh, uh, what the big, huge needs are in, in cancer care. And one of them, of course, is to be able to guide clinical decision making, to find cancer early, to be able to um, assess uh, what therapies patients should be put on, how they're doing, and then if there's a recurrence. Uh, and, and one of the main issues is that uh, we don't have enough ways to make these decisions. Uh, one challenge is, um, simply put, that we are sort of limited by what the body gives us. So you've been hearing today about imaging agents and smart imaging agents, and, and that's one way to find out what's going on inside the body. The other is the so-called biomarker paradigm. And so for this paradigm, the idea is that you would take a blood sample and you would look at what the tumor sheds systemically. If you look in the literature, um, this is the so-called liquid biopsy space. There are many, many um, biomarkers emerging, big, large, uh, 100,000 patient clinical trials that are going on for many years in a variety of areas. Um, and so the, the challenges that come up in this area are sort of threefold. Um, the one is that um, these are all endogenous biomarkers. So of course, you can only ever find in the blood what is shed there. Um, many of these biomarkers are unstable in the circulation, so if you're looking at nucleic acids or metabolites, they're sort of falling apart as you go, um, and that's the nature of, of, of the chemistry, if you will. Um, the second challenge is historically these have been singular. So the sort of poster child for this is prostate-specific antigen, PSA. And I think, as you all know, if you have just a single marker, if you define a threshold, then you either are going to be doing a sensitivity trade-off or a specificity trade-off. So if you're super sensitive, then um, you're going to have false negatives. And if you set the threshold lower, then you're going to have false positives. So um, that's, that's the challenge with having a singular biomarker. Um, and then finally, you know, from an engineering perspective, blood is actually a, a, a terrible matrix. <laughs> it's full of proteins and other analytes. Um, there's five liters of it to dilute your sample. Um, so, you know, one of my favorite examples of sort of just the mathematics of this was actually published by Sam's group now in a study about five years ago in Science Translational Medicine. So, for those of you sort of engineering math geeks in the crowd, um, you can actually look up um, the quantitative framework by which you can look at what is it, what is the possible sensitivity limitation of this whole, um, um, whole system. 
And so Worcester have been thinking about another way to go about this, um, and that is the idea that maybe you could use the body to make a biomarker. Maybe you could use the tumor to catalyze the production of an analyte by which you could make a measurement. And so the way that we think about doing that is shown here, and the idea is that you give an exogenous probe, a nanomaterial, and these probes are designed to enter into the tumor microenvironment and be catalytically activated by enzymes, proteases, in the tumor microenvironment that you have designed them against. So you're not relying on any shedding. And the way the materials are designed is shown here. So typically the material will have on its surface a peptide motif that is sensitive to enzymatic cleavage. One copy of an enzyme can cleave about 1,000 peptides per hour. And then the liberated fragment can be designed to be a reporter. Um, so you can design it to be, to be free in the blood. Or what we like to do, actually, is design it to be filtered in the urine. So the, the larger parent will not come out in the urine, but the daughter reporter is smaller than 5 nanometers and can be renally filtered and concentrated in the urine. And then if you make different flavors of these, then you can have different reporters that you barcode, and then you can multiplex the signal. So these are exogenous agents. They enter into the tumor microenvironment. Oops. They're, they're catalytically activated. They can be multiplexed, and then they can be concentrated into the urine. And of course, that's five liters of blood into a couple hundred mils of urine. So for every copy of an enzyme, you get about a 20,000-fold signal amplification. That's the basic idea. Um, and so this is the sort of family of proteases um, that we've been thinking about. Uh, there's, there's actually about 2% of the human genome is made of proteases, roughly half intra and extracellular. Um, and if you look up a typical review in uh, cancer biology, this is one now from uh, 2007, you can find that actually the literature is, is um, full of the role of the endoproteases in cancer progression, so in, in growth, in invasion, sorry, I'm having trouble with this clicker. In, um, in growth, in survival, in the so-called angiogenic switch, in invasion of the extracellular matrix, and in remodeling, in metastasis, and also the immune cells that um, are recruited to the microenvironment make their own proteases. So this is a really very rich biology um, that one can kind of listen in on. Um, and what's important about it is that it's actually resident in the tumor microenvironment. So all these catalytic processes are happening locally in the tumor and very often not shed in the circulation. So you wouldn't be able to access them without sending a probe um, into the tumor to make these measurements. Um, so this is what we wanted to, to sort of uh, develop this platform around. So we call these synthetic biomarkers, like you're making your own biomarker. And I want to walk you sort of through three different aspects of the technology. So the first is the idea of just exploring how sensitive this material could possibly be. Um, the next will be specificity, and the third will be sort of actionability, like what can you do with it clinically. So to explore sensitivity, and this is just a movie to sort of capture um, some of the ideas that I was telling you about before, for those of you who are more visual. So this is a vessel surrounded by a tumor. And um, here we've injected these nanomaterials systemically into the circul circulation. They're extravasating into the interstitial microenvironment of the tumor. These are about 20 nanometer materials that have been designed here. These particular materials have been designed to be sensitive to MMP9 which is a type 4 collagenase that's involved with the angiogenic switch um, in cancer progression that was first reported by Doug Hanahan and colleagues. These materials then get activated, so that's a cleavage event. One copy of MMP9 can liberate these reporters. These reporters are designed to be D-amino acid peptides so that they are no longer degraded once they are released. They're stable in the circulation. They then get re-enter the circulation here, so the five liters of blood, but now they're smaller than five nanometers, and they're made of D-amino acids. They don't interact with the kidney physiology by design, and they can be concentrated from that five liters into those 200 mils of urine. You can do this for different proteases, and, and then you can encode the um, reporter in, in any fashion that you choose. 
Okay, so that's the basic way the technology works. So let's now explore the sensitivity of the technology. So the first thing to do is actually design these against the proteases of interest. So as I told you, we were interested in doing this in MP9. This particular um, image is actually around thrombin. And this shows you how we first invented the materials. So this is a version of the material was that original MRI contrast agent that I told you about. So this was an iron oxide material that was dextran coated. And on its surface, we had peptides that were fluorescently conjugated. And we put so many peptides on the surface that they undergo what's called homoquenching, so there's no fluorescence. And when you then incubate them with an with a enzyme that can cut this peptide, you cleave that um, peptide off the surface, and the quenching is, um, is uh, uninhibited, and these turn on. So this is a fluorescence on sensor. So you can see here in vitro, we've added thrombin into this solution, and this sensor is turning on because this peptide is being cut. And importantly, if you add other enzymes, the sensor doesn't turn on. So you can design very specific um, sensors against the different uh, enzymes. And if we now inject these in, a in, in an animal, this is an animal with a, a liver disease where it's making a protease in its liver. And um, what you see is when the animal has this uh, fibrotic liver disease, the material is getting activated and it's accumulating there as well as in the control. And the activated material is liberating the reporter and it's finding its way into this second site. This is how we first discovered these materials. This is actually the bladder, okay? Um, so this is a quick and easy way that the students see if the materials are working. <laughs> After an hour, they check if the bladder is lighting up. Um, and then we go back and we do all the quantitation. So these are super sensitive materials. They can be designed. Um, actually, we can make libraries of these materials. So this is just an example. The library of the materials that we made, we screen them against recombinant proteases, and you can define then different material coatings for different protease sensitivities. Okay, so the question then is, in, in an in vivo context, how sensitive could a system like that be? And, to, and in order to test that, we looked at MMP9, as I mentioned before. MMP9 was very interesting because it had been reported to be important for that early stage of angiogenesis, as I mentioned, the recruitment of vessels to the tumor where um, it needs to out, outstrip its, um, its nutrient limitation. And so if you look um, in the Cancer Genome Atlas, um, you can find that MMP9 is in fact upregulated in a whole host of solid tumors. So that was encouraging. Uh, furthermore, if you look on protein microarrays here of colorectal cancer, you can find MMP9 at the protein level um, in, these, uh, in these patient samples. Um, and then in collaboration with Richard Hines, and Ken Tanabe at the MGH, who developed a proteomic technique to look in human samples, we also looked in patients where um, we looked both at primary colorectal tumors as well as their liver metastases. And what we found is actually that you could find MMP9 both in the primaries and in their liver mets. So we can find at the message level, at the protein level, and then also in the extracellular matrix of patient tumors that MMP9 was expressed. So we kind of liked it as a target. We had a nice sensor for it, and so we wanted to ask um, basically uh, how sensitive, as I said, could it be. So then we needed an animal model for this um, particular experiment, and what we did was go to the cell line encyclopedia and collect colorectal cancer cell lines. Um, and what we found was that um, amongst all these different cell lines, actually the levels of MMP9 expression was only varied by about 50%. However, if you looked at how much of a classic protein biomarker that they made that you might want to compare them to, um, in this case CEA, actually you could see that it varied by about four logs. Um, and this is perhaps one of the reasons why this secreted protein biomarker CEA is not a very good biomarker for colorectal cancer. So we took a cell line that had high levels of the classic secreted protein biomarker, which you would find in the blood, and a low level even though they didn't have very much difference in their MMP9 expression, and asked, basically, how good could we be at detecting tumors of these kind? Um, so we took the high secretor, we made xenografts to animals out of it. So here's an animal with xenograft colorectal tumors in it and an MMP9 sensor. And again, you can hear, see here that trick, the bladder is lighting up um, right away. You can see urinary fluorescence increasing. Um, and if you inhibit the MMPs with an inhibitor, that this is inhibited. So we could see that we could detect tumors of this particular size, one centimeter, um, in this animal. 
that um, if you looked in the blood of this animal at a particular day and time, so day 10 in this model, that if you looked in the blood at that CEA biomarker, that this is um, a so-called rock curve. So this is a good biomarker would be an area under the curve of 1, and a non-predictive one would be 0.5. So you can see here this blood biomarker is not very good as c compared to urine at this sort of day 10 time point. So um, that's all well and good. This is the sort of high secretor. But then the question might be clinically, like how good could your biomarker be at detecting the biomarker low tumors? Because those are the ones that you'd really like to be able to use this technology on. So um, we then set out to make xenograft tumors out of that second cell line that I showed you, the low secretor. And you can see in the blood of this animal, actually, that the protein biomarker actually never comes up. And so the question is, how do you do in this model? And in fact, at now day 13, you in fact can see a robust urine signal using an MMP9 sensor. And so the premise, as I said, is that both these tumors are invasive. They need to make MMP9 to invade and spread. And whether or not they make this shed protein biomarker, which is sort of an epiphenomenon, um, is irrelevant to the sensing technology. So that was quite interesting in mice. And we wanted to then ask how well this could do in patients. Um, in order to do that, we did some of the allometric scaling that Mark Davis talked about this morning. Um, and so uh, we, as engineers, wanted to build a mathematical model in order to do that. So we picked a biomaterial. We re-engineered the nanomaterial in a format that it would be translatable to patients, just like Michelle was just talking about. So this is actually a PEG biomaterial now, a polyethylene glycol. We threw out the MRI core because we no longer were interested in MRI imaging. We're just going to collect um, urine. So this is just a polymer biomaterial now. Um, and we, um, in the mouse model, measured a whole bunch of parameters that allowed us to look model basically in this multi-compartmental model, the PK of the animal, and then scale that to patients. And then we could ask quantitatively, using this data, how well could we do at detecting a one centimeter mass in patients um, as compared to the CEA levels, the blood biomarker levels of the high secretor. Um, and what you see here basically is that you have an 80-fold signal-to-noise enhancement in the urine relative to the blood of this protein biomarker in the high secretor. And of course, in the low secretor, the one that never comes up in the blood, they are infinitely better. Um, so that was quite encouraging. And that was all done with a material that's not targeted. We spent some of the time today talking about materials that actually have enhanced affinity for certain tumors. Um, so we wanted to ask the question whether we could do even better um, than, than that previous example with the colon cancer um, for a disseminated ovarian cancer, an early ovarian cancer. So this is work that, um, that um, Angie introduced earlier, um, where um, we create an ovarian cancer model with very small disseminated tumors in the interperitoneal cavity. And we ask, um, how sensitive could the system be in this model? And in order to enhance the sensitivity, what we did was explore the role of targeting. So here we made a target version of the biomaterials. We added a peptide ligand on the surface. This is so-called IRGD, or um, internalizing RGD, that was des described by Erki Ruslati and colleagues. Um, and what we find is kind of interesting. So the um, tumor accumulation of this material is only about two to four-fold the untargeted material. But um, when we do this, nevertheless, we see an enhanced signal-to-noise of about 14-fold. Um, and our hypothesis is, is that these materials are localizing in the tuber microenvironment in a way that the enzyme catalysis um, is allowed to just cycle um, and generate more and more reporters. So even though you only get a two, two to four-fold more a bulk accumulation, you actually get a 14-fold higher signal-to-noise. Um, and you can see in this model, in an ovarian cancer model, again, that you can do better um, than the blood biomarker for ovarian cancer that we had in this model, which is called HE4. So you can detect it earlier than you could in the blood. And this sort of one week in this model is thought to be um, about a five-month equivalent in patients. Um, and again, at this time point, that you can do better um, with the urine assay than the blood biomarker. OK, so that's a long, long walk through sensitivity. But hopefully, I've convinced you that using enzymes to catalyze the liberation of reporters is a potentially sensitive way to create a biomarker. And so the next thing you might ask, then, is how might one go about making sure that this is a specific system? Because in engineering, if you make something very sensitive, then you have, I guess I said before, the potential for false positives. So the answer to that is making multiple measurements. And you only make the call when you have multiple measurements going high. So that's a 
specificity. So in order to get specificity in this system, you need multiplexing. And the way we do multiplexing, which I alluded to earlier, is to make a cocktail of these materials. So here now we have 10 different materials. Each material is sensitive to a different protease. And the way these materials are barcoded is that the reporter, in this case, has a unique mass. So we administer the cocktail. Each one is sensitive to a different protease. The reporters are liberated. They find their way into the urine. You collect the urine, and you mass spec the urine. And that allows you now to query the catalytic activity of a panel of proteases against which you've designed the formulation. Um, so uh, for those mass spec docs in the crowd, this is just an example of one of our first libraries. This was our first 10 plex that we published. We now sort of routinely do typically 20 to 30 of these. Um, and I'm going to show you how this works in the context of a lung cancer detection story. So um, this is um, the so-called, what some people have started to call the nodule epidemic in non-small cell lung cancer. So um, this is uh, the idea that, of course, there are many patients now who have long smoking histories who are at high risk for lung cancer. And there's been a new recommendation made that these patients should be screened with low-dose um, CAT scan. Um, so that's starting to happen um, nationwide, and what we're finding now is that we find a lot of lung nodules um, on these scans that look like uh, interstitial changes in COPD and um, interstitial lung disease, so other pulmonary diseases. And in fact, if you then do a bronchoscopy on these patients, it turns out that 95% of these nodules are not malignant. Okay, so the false positive rate is incredibly high. And so one thought might be then, can you do a test when you find this nodule to say, is this cancer or not cancer? So this is not quite an early detection um, experiment, but it's a question about whether you can stratify this disease versus the other pulmonary diseases that might look similar on a scan. So in order to do that, we went to the publicly available genomics databases and asked, are there different proteases in these different diseases? And in fact, you can look in the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, and you can just pull out the top uh, 20 or so proteases that are involved with lung cancer. And then it turns out there are also databases in the Lung Genomics Research Consortium that allow you to pull out proteases for COPD and ILD. And in fact, you can come up with, at least at the RNA level, classifiers that allow you to distinguish between these different diseases. So that was very intriguing. What we wanted to do then was build a probe set um, just around making the cancer call, and then go back in a mouse model and see whether we could detect lung cancer. So we teamed up with Tyler Jacks using his uh, KP mice. Um, and used the now PEG formulation that I've described to you already, which is shown here. So this is the PEG core and the mass spec reporter. And in this particular experiment, we have uh, 14 different reporters, so 14 different proteases. Um, and then we wanted to do one more thing, which to enhance the signal to noise of the system, um, and that was that we gave the sensors in the pulmonary space by inhalation. So you don't have to give them into the blood. You can give them by inhalation. And then you'll get an even higher enzymatic signal out of the lung. Um, and then you can still collect the reporter in the bladder after one hour. Okay, so we have 14 different probes. We give them by inhalation. We collect the urine in an hour. And then we mass spec it. And we look for uh, tumor signatures. So this is a lot of data. <laughs> um, and I won't walk you through all of it. But um, you can use, basically, these 14 probes over time in KP mice, so five weeks, seven and a half weeks, and 10 and a half weeks, and ask, how early could you classify tumors in these mice who look otherwise normal, who don't actually have um, CT-detectable tumors until about 10 weeks of presentation? Um, and the answer turns out to be at about seven and a half weeks, you can get about a 92% sensitivity and a 90% specificity using these 14 probes. Um, and again, you can get a, a pretty nice rock curve at, at that moment. So these are early days. We're just getting started. Um, you can see in this data set that some of these probes are totally uninformative. And so the cool thing about the system is you can now throw these out um, and, and actually input in other ones um, and, and sort of iterate on this system um, to increase your accuracy. Um, so, so that's an example of how multiplexing can get you not just sensitivity, but specificity in the context of a lung cancer application. 
Um, and in the last few minutes, I'd like to talk about ways that we're thinking about um, taking this uh, test beyond the idea of mass spec, which is, at the end of the day, a really high-end clinical tool um, to more disseminatable applications. Um, so the first example is, is the idea that um, in a global setting, one might think about doing point-of-care testing, and urine is actually an amazing matrix in which to make measurements at the point of care. Um, this is just a quote from a, from a paper that I loved in the New England Journal, which was sort of um, a, an echo on the, on the cancer moonshot, and they called it the moonshot to Malawi. Um, and in this article, they talked about um, really the diagnostic limitations um, in, in Africa. So this is a, um, just a quote that says, no diagnostic pathology services existed in, in Malawi's capital and home to more than a million people until 2011. Um, so it's just really remarkable how, um, how far we have to go. And so inspired by the, the paper diagnostics, the lateral flow assays that have been revolutionary for HIV, uh, we adapted our assay, um, instead of being a mass spec barcoded assay, to be barcoded by ligand. And we put it on paper. So you can print antibodies on paper that will catch these ligands. And so now you have a paper diagnostic version of this test. Um, and the students and I kind of imagine that you could take a picture of this paper diagnostic on a smartphone um, and maybe send it to a remote provider. Um, the other thing we've been thinking about is if you were going to inhale um, the test, instead of waiting an hour to do a urine test, maybe you could exhale the readout. So um, this is some work that um, Leslie Chan and Melody Yanatar are doing in my lab. Um, and the idea now is that you could re-engineer this PEG carrier to, instead of releasing a urinary reporter upon cleavage, they could actually release a volatile organic a gas. Um, so the way we imagine this, and it turns out to be a fluorocarbon, this is the mouse getting its first gas um, breath test, breathalyzer test. I mean, you can see when it has a pulmonary disease and you collect the gas, um, you can see these volatiles in the setting of disease coming out now in 10 and 20 minutes. Um, so the vision is that um, this actually could be a breathalyzer at the point of care where you inhale for a lung cancer detection and exhale. Again, early days, but another way to do the readout. Um, and finally, in my last example, the question that we always get is, um, well, that's very interesting. So you could get a urine test, and you could maybe longitudinally monitor. But then how would you then define where the tumor is systemically? So we've been starting to think about multimodal agents that would allow us to then um, image uh, tumors. So this is worth by Liang Hao in the lab, where she's made basically a PET version of this probe. So it's the same pegylated probe that you've been seeing before. It has a urinary reporter, but it also has the ability to chelate a PET ligand. Um, and so here is, um, if this movie's going to play, um, in the interest of time, but this is an animal with a liver metastasis of colon cancer, and you can see that it's lighting up with the PET ligand. And so the way we imagine this happening is um, here is a longitudinal study of a tumor that's growing and one that's responding to chemotherapy, and you can see that in sequential urine samples. And you might now, at this point, ask, um, where is the tumor located? And in fact, then you could do a PET scan um, using the same exact probe that had been labeled with, in this case, copper 64, um, and start to pair the urine measurements with imaging measurements. Um, and that might inform surgery, um, or it might inform um, decisions about um, next steps in chemotherapy. OK, so um, in, <laughs> I've uh, told you about the system and how um, it's sensitive, and how one can multiplex it, and then how we're designing it for um, future actionability to prevent, um, treat, or um, intervene with these patients. And um, I'll just thank you for your attention, and I'll see you at the break. <laughs>